Hi, it's Mo Bunnell, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. I'm author of The Snowball System, and I and my teams have trained over 15,000 high-end professionals all over the world on sound, effective, efficient, and authentic business development techniques. That word authentic is probably the most important one. <laughs> and what I'm going to bring to you today is an interview with David Berkus. Now, David Berkus is an organizational psychologist. He's a former professor. He has written several best-selling books, and we're really going to dig into his latest. It's called Leading from Anywhere. And boy, is that topic important over the next decade or so. Our virtual world is going to force us to lead not only our internal teams, and that's what most of the book is written about from that perspective, but also lead our external client relationships, our relationships with prospects, clients, and, and all the partners in our ecosystem. And the idea of getting good at virtual is something that's obviously not going to go away, but it's going to increase in its value in the years and decades to come. So one of the I reached out to the foremost expert in the world, David, because I wanted to figure out how do we become great at living in this digital world that's been thrust upon us and is getting more important, not less. In this first episode, I'm going to ask David a question, a big one. What big idea does he have when it comes to leading from anywhere? What big idea does he have that'll help us grow our book of business, grow our relationships, and grow our career when we're doing those first two? But before we get to that, know that if you want our great content delivered to you at no charge every single week, head over to growbigplaybook.com. Growbigplaybook.com. Not only will you get an instant download you can read in like eight minutes that has the eight beliefs you need to hardwire in your brain around growth to be successful, but you'll also get a weekly newsletter that delivers our latest thinking on business development dropped right in your inbox at no charge. So if you want that, which is pretty good, you should want it, go to growbigplaybook.com. All right, this interview was a hoot to record. David is a absolutely, he's that blend of wickedly smart, but also really, really funny. And we just had a blast in this episode in the ones to come. So without further ado, here's David Burkus. Hey everybody, it's Mo. You already know that we're talking to David Burkus. We're going to dig into his book, Leading From Anywhere. I'm super excited about it because if there's one question that we've gotten here at Bundle Idea Group in the past year or so since the pandemic hit, that's when we're taping this, it's how do you develop relationships with your clients virtually? How do you lead big implementation teams virtually? How do you lead from anywhere both internally, which is obviously important to rainmakers and big client developers, but we can apply those same principles externally and they're going to work like a charm. David, I know our audience is absolutely going to dig into this series of, of episodes we're going to tape with you. So here's your first question. Think about our audience, high-end professionals with, with one foot in delivery, one foot in business development. They might be a real little reluctant on the business development side, and they're trying to do things virtually these days. So what's your big idea on how folks can, can create more business, retain and grow? How can they deepen relationships? How can they grow their career? How can leading from anywhere help them be more successful in the broadest sense possible? Yeah, well, I, I think the big idea here is a recognition that the future of work is working from anywhere, right? This isn't a temporary issue. Remember when we thought it was? We thought that it was 14 days to slow the spread or 15 days. We'll be, we'll be back in the office in two weeks. And then here we are a year later. And, and the truth is that we're not all going back to the office. Even before the pandemic, uh, the, the, the research from Gallup showed that people were most engaged when they were 40 to 60% of the time out of the office. So if we're thinking about the implications for just about anything, it means that we need greater flexibility and an increase in trust and autonomy with the people that we collaborate with. That means internally, but that also means with our clients. We don't have the in-person meetings where we can smooth things out, right? We don't have that ability to take as many nonverbal cues as working in person together as we used to. So we need to get much more deliberate about our communication. Uh, communication is actually more important in a remote environment, not less so. 
And I think we also need to be much more empathetic to the situation people are dealing with. You know, we have a tendency to think that no, that no news is bad news, right? Because presence equals productivity. If my people are around me, they're working. If a client is quick to respond or a potential client is quick to respond, that means they're hot. That means they're interested. Like, no, right? It, it may actually mean they have nothing else to do, right? And that's especially true in today's environment that we need to be much more clear, much more deliberate about how we communicate, much more empathetic. And truthfully, one of the first things we need to be doing, even with prospective clients, is talking about how we're going to work together if we work together. Because getting that with deliberate intention about what the future of our relationship looks like, that's never been more important. We don't have time to figure it out on the back end. Let's talk about it now in this virtual environment where we're not seeing each other all the time, where we're not responding to each other all the time. How are we going to work together? That's part of the, the process of really closing the deal at this point is here's what working together looks like with us. Oh, David, this is so good. I can't tell you how many calls I and our teams have been on where we're teaching how to do some of this stuff, like like 5%, I think, of what's in the book. And one of the like simple things is get your clients on video like so you can see them. So many of our clients were resistant at first, like, oh, Zoom fatigue. You know, We don't want to get them on video. We want to ask to have them on video. But you got to if you're going to communicate well. So my question back to you is, I know we've got a couple more episodes. We're going to dig into some things deeper. But at a high level, if you could give a couple tips on how to communicate better, both internally and especially externally, what would they be? Yeah, I think the, the biggest one I'll give you is just a straight technical clip, which is eye contact is not eye contact. We're on this call right now. If I made eye contact with you, it means I'm looking at you, Mo. Do I feel engaged right now? Do I feel like you're understanding me? No. Eye contact is camera lens contact, right? So there's little things um, like that. Uh, figuring out your lighting adjustments, uh, that sort of thing. I, I think the biggest thing in terms of communicating virtually, though, is recognizing that communication happens in multiple formats. And it is much more asynchronous than synchronous, right? So yes, get your people on Zoom calls, have those conversations, but also know you're going to be working more asynchrony, asynchronously with them than ever before. That means make sure that you are like triple check your emails at this point, right? Make sure you've got clear writing and clear thinking in your written communication. Um, and make sure you're clear when you wanna do which one at which time. The biggest breakdown in teams, internal or project teams that are multiple different companies working together, the biggest communication breakdown in a virtual setting happens because people aren't clear about which medium of communication we use for which issue or which type of meeting. So we need to be really clear on that as well. Gosh, I never thought about that. But like, I just think of our internal, you can't help but think of yourself. I think of our internal communications. We've got phone calls, we've got texts, we've got Slack, we've got Trello boards that are all moving around. We've got Zoom calls, we've got all these other things. So um, one last question on this big topic before we wrap up with this episode and do it in the next one. What's the What's the best way to work with clients on figuring out which platform are we using for which way of communication? How do you get that deal done so that you're then you're streamlined for success? So I'm a little biased here, I, and I think that the best way to do it is to already have it set up on your internal team. So when I work with teams, and this is why I'm biased, I'm biased because it's my favorite activity to do. I encourage them to create a team working agreement, a sort of declaration of interdependence. It means we ask all of those questions. When do we use the Trello board and what for? When do we use Slack? When do we use email? What's a reasonable amount of time to wait before we jump from an asynchronous communication to synchronous, right? Am I calling you two hours after I send an email? Probably inappropriate. 24 hours? You know, it depends on the team, right? We need to get all of that set so that when we go to the client, we can actually say, now, when we work with clients like you in this remote environment, here's how we tend to do it so that they can already get a picture of what it looks like for you. And by the way, they'll probably end up stealing your team working agreement too, but that's okay. You're both better off for it. That's so good. All right, gosh darn it. I wasn't going to ask you one more question on this one, but now I'm going to because you got it. Give us some tips on building that agreement and then we'll close out this episode. But it's so good. I got to grab a hold of it. Okay, go. Yeah. So the best thing you can do, this is a synchronous conversation, right? So schedule a meeting where the purpose is to come up with this and nothing else. This is not tag it on to your weekly meeting and it's not tag other agenda items onto it. Um, and then structure it around questions. So the questions, I mean, specifically the questions that I asked are great templates. 
what tools are we going to use and what things were we going to converse on? So I, I'm of the opinion, this is a personal opinion, that a tool like Slack is actually the water cooler. It's for non-work conversations. But the team needs to agree to that, right? Um, and they need to agree that email or Trello, et cetera, is better for project management updates. So we structured as questions. How are we going to make requests for help? How are we going to give each other feedback? Right. And then even little stuff like what are our operating hours? Structure it all as questions and get answer to those questions, preferably in a shared document like a Google Doc that everyone can see and contribute to at the same time. And then when all of the questions are answered, turn those questions into statements. We agree that Trello is for project management uh, updates. We agree that Slack is reserved for personal conversations. We agree that 24 hours is a reasonable amount of time to wait for an email or Trello response before we bother someone with a phone call, right? We agree, we agree, we agree. It's a declaration of interdependence, right? We agree we on, on all of these things. And then lock the document, share it widely so that people can see it. Revisit it every once in a while, but you don't want people sort of sneaking in there. And it becomes the document you hold the team accountable to. And I mean, how amazing would it be, by the way, to hand every client a, like, like I get a user's manual whenever I buy a new car, right? How amazing would it be to be like, this is the owner's manual for working with our team? How much does that set you apart? David, home run. It is so great. What a great closer. We we went from high level down to practical tips people can put in place right away. So people are gonna our audience is gonna want to know more about you. Where do they go to learn more? Ah, so the best place would be davidberkus.com. And if you have no idea how to spell my last name, that's fine. Just type it into Google and Google will correct you. Um, we've even got there a tool that'll guide you through. It's a three-page PDF that'll guide you through the team working agreement. So check that out. You don't have to buy the book to get that agreement. Just check it out. Let me know if it's helpful. There'll be other ways to connect with me on that website as well. So davidberkus.com is the place to go. I love it. Cool. All right, folks. Well, if you like this one, be ready for the next episode because we're going to double click. We're going to get David's advice on how do you actually get more deals across the goal line in this virtual world? How do you foster trust? How do you, how do you get that? Yes. And I can't wait to hear David's response. So check out the next episode for that. Hi, everybody. It's Mo, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. I'm back with David Burkus. If you didn't pick up the last episode, make sure you listen to it because, or watch it too, because he gave some really great tips on how you get your internal teams working together in a remote environment and how that translates to external. Now, in this episode, David's going to ask sort of the magic question. Let's let's say that you used to take the private equity people out to the big steakhouse in New York City to develop that relationship, or you used to fly to Denver to, to have that one hour lunch and fly home. And we used to be in person to foster trust and to create demand and to close deals. So David, my question to you is, and this should be a lot of fun, while the, while the book is obviously oriented toward managing and leading internal teams from anywhere, I think some of those, the application could be external as well, because basically our clients are on our team or on their team, or once the once they've all, we've all agreed to work together, we're all focused in the same direction, trying to accomplish a big win for everybody. So what's your big tip around how we can sort of build, create demand, get deals done and expand from there virtually? Yeah, well, you know, you mentioned it right off the top. A, a big factor of this is trust and deepening that relationship before they feel comfortable moving forward with you. And while we while we used to do this in person, I, I think we were deliberate about it in this context, right? You mentioned the dinner or or going just for that lunch, et cetera. But let's be honest, like it was never the actual activity, right? It was the white space around the activity that really built the bonds, right? It wasn't the dinner, it was the 15 to 20 minutes when there's only three people left at the dinner, you're all sort of finishing dessert or just kind of hanging out, right? And unfortunately, in a virtual context, we don't build that white space in, right? We say, hey, we got a Zoom meeting at 11 a.m. We pop on at 11 a.m. We do, this is my personal pet peeve, we wait three minutes for everybody to figure it out. What if you made it clear that, hey, our call's at 10, but I'm free starting at 9.45, so I'm going to be on if you want to just jump on, Right. Or, or if you conclude the meeting and then just say, hey, you know, we're here as a team. If you get people used to the idea that that's white space. Internally, this is kind of like the meeting before the meeting that always happens in the hallway as you walk towards the meeting room. Um, but it, it's the same deal when working with clients or prospective clients. You, you build trust and you build bonds in that open space that used to happen because you were physically occupying the same space. 
Well, now we need ways to sort of replicate that, right? I mean, and you saw people try and do this in the beginning in ways that didn't necessarily work, the Zoom happy hours that we all got hung over from, right? And just had way too many of and ended up with Zoom fatigue because it's never actually about what you're doing. It's about the white space in what you're doing, that unstructured time where you find what uh, what Adam Grant would call uncommon commonalities, right? Things that you and each other share that are unique. And if you don't plan for that time, it doesn't happen in a virtual environment. So so plan for that time. So build it in. Build that habit of letting people know, oh, yeah, we're, we're it's our policy to always be on uh, five or 10 minutes early. So you got nothing to do, jump on and we'll just talk, right? And then worst case scenario, if they if the client never does, then you still have white space time with your team because two or three people from the team all jumped on at the same time, right? So it works in a variety of cases. That, that Zoom call, well, that's just one trick, right? But there's a lot to think about. What were the white space moments that built real relationships that I was doing in, in person? And then how can I deliberately put those back virtually so that I'm creating that same unstructured time to have the non-work conversations that make it more likely we're going to work together? I like that a lot, David. Um, let me let me give you a specific scenario. This is fun because we didn't prep for this, so I'll throw you a curveball. Although I think you're going to like the curveball; it doesn't break very much. <laughs> um, one of the one of the techniques we've been using a lot in in our uh, with our clients is called a value group, and it's where you, in a very unstructured way, put a group of like minded people together. Maybe if you had eight people in a group, maybe six are actual clients and two are prospects. You're going to let them mingle around. Typically, we're going to have the same kind of roles. And we're like in a webinar, the primary way of, of adding value is the content, but you don't really get a lot of socialization. Here in the value group, the primary is the socialization, people with similar roles in non-competitive companies. And we're going to pick the content from, say, quarter to quarter if we meet quarterly. But um, but the real value is getting to know people over time. The, the, the primary value is the relationships. So here's your curveball. Without any prep at all, how would somebody structure a hour or 90 minute virtual call? You know, it's on Zoom or whatever, so that you could really have a wonderful environment and people get to know each other and trust is being built, maybe with some clients and with some prospects as well. What do you think? Yeah. So I would focus that conversation. I mean, I would be very deliberate about the questions. Like you're, you're like you said, it's not about the content delivery in this type of model. It's giving space for people to ask questions and get answers. Specifically when I'm structuring the questions though, I would look to by the end of that 90 minutes to have people feeling safe enough to share problems and hear solutions from their peers. You know, the interesting thing about a meeting like this is even if I come in as a prospect and I ask a question and one of your clients has a solution, I still associate receiving that solution with you, right? And even though I follow up with that person, I build a relationship, you're still the person that brought the value to me. So you're still who I assume to be true. So that would be what I would be doing. I'm structuring early. The questions are around getting us to know each other, but I want to get to the point where I'm giving everyone who's in that meeting the opportunity to share a problem that they're facing and let the other people in the group kind of give them suggestions or help probe that or solve it for them. And if it gets solved again, like, okay, you might have thought the problem was your opportunity to work with that client. And maybe it's not about that problem, but they definitely still associate you with that solution. And that pays long term dividends, which is, I mean, what we want in the end anyway. Yeah. And, and I totally agree. And one of the things we love about value groups is it turns the default on, meaning we don't have to remember to reach out to Jane again. Hey, every quarter we're getting together with Jane and these other seven people or whatever. Um, so it turns the default on. The other thing we love about it is it mixes clients with prospects. So it's a great, it's almost like a built-in reference check when they all get together and start bonding. So my, my question is, and, and I was dying, I was hoping you'd go there, but I get asked the questions here. So I get to <laughs> steer it where I wanted. Do you have any good questions like in your hip pocket that as you talked about that structure, which I really liked about getting to know each other and then starting to share a little more deeply, like what, what people are working on or what they're struggling with or whatever. Do you have any good sample questions that people can just grab onto that are, that are listening to this or watching? Yeah. So my, my favorite question, because it's innocent, it doesn't say, well, you know, what's your problem, right? Which is a fairly aggressive question. Um, it's innocent, but it provides the transition from a light conversation to a deep conversation. I actually stole it from uh, a good friend of mine, Jason Gaynard. He stole it from somebody else. But it's a question that I'm part of a, a professional group, and we ask this question of each other all the time. And the question, it's the champagne question. If you and I are at a restaurant a year from now, and we're popping open a bottle of champagne, what are we toasting to? Right? What in your life, in your career, in your business, whatever it is, are we celebrating a year from now? And the reason I like that question is you can answer it in a couple different ways, but every way that you answer it 
presents a problem, the problem of getting to that moment, right? So it opens up that conversation because the very next question, of course, is great. You know, what's your plan? How are you working on that now? And you can use that to find those things. So it's become my favorite question. If you and I met, met again together a year from now with a bottle of champagne, what are we celebrating? I love that question. And somebody could lightly ask that question to somebody they're getting to know that they, they met at some virtual conference and in a group and now they're one-on-one, -on -one and but, but they're potentially a client of ours. So you're starting to steer the conversation a little bit in this real positive way for us working together out in the future. But what, what would have happened? Um, and of course, we probably would, to your point, wouldn't blurt that out right out of the gate. But it's, but it's a really good one to transition, transition from uh, the light to the actual meaningful, more commercial relationship. David, this has been awesome. If you, people are going to want to know one more about you, they're going to want to dig deeper. Where should they go? Uh, so the, the absolute best place would be davidberkus.com. It's my website. It's a weird last name. Uh, I'm also the only one with any web presence among the David Berkuses of the world. So if you type it in wrong into Google, you'll still find me, which is great. Um, and we've got actually, we've got a resource on that website, not about questions around problems, but it's a great socialization guide. It's called eight questions to ask other than what do you do? And it's just a great way to kick off a relationship with some a way better question than just what do you do? Because Let's be honest, most people don't even want to answer that question. If 80% of people are unengaged from their job, then 80% of people don't want to be asked what they want to do. They want to be asked a better question, like the champagne one we were talking about. I love it. And then you've given a resource. So everybody go to davidberkus.com. <laughs> David, I was uh, I was laughing because the way you said you're, you've become the most famous of the David Berkuses, I think I've <laughs> definitely become the most famous of the Mo Bunnels. So like two of us, we've we've hit it. We've hit our we've hit the high water mark, I think. So <laughs> thanks for being on the show. This has been awesome, folks. If you didn't catch David's episode from, from that we issued yesterday, episode yes, published yesterday, about the big idea on how we can use his, his uh, lead from anywhere process to really take control of our career and, and grab our growth, go back and watch and listen to that one. And be careful to make sure that you listen to this next and watch this next episode, because I'm going to ask David, what do we use from all of his toolkit in leading from everywhere to deepen relationships? Hey, everybody, it's Mo, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. If you didn't catch them, go back and listen to the prior two episodes where I asked David Burkus some secret questions that I'm not going to tell you now that were really good, and you're going to learn a lot from them. But today, I want to dig into one thing. And David, this is, this is maybe the thing that's popped up more than any other question over the past year or so of our client base. And it's real simple. How do I develop and deepen relationships when everything is virtual? So can you use the content and leading from everywhere and help us answer that question? Because I know people are on the edge of their seat. They want to know the secret sauce that you've got in your brain. Yeah, yeah. So you're, you're exactly right. This is a real problem. I mean, I was reading a study. It, it obviously couldn't make it into leading from anywhere. It was I was reading it because uh, it was published a week ago, but it was looking at the first half of 2020, looking at people's um, networks, judging the size of somebody's networks and relationships. And it found that from January to June, the average person's network shrunk by 25 to 30 percent. Right. Uh, but here's what I think is interesting. That that decrease was almost entirely driven by males. And this is a hasty generalization. I realize uh, gender is much more diverse than just this. But um, because it, on average, men tend to bond and build relationships around activities, women tend to do it around conversations, and there are no activities to participate in when the world is locked down, right? So we saw almost all of the reduction in relationships on that one side, that activity-driven side, not necessarily the conversation side. And, and you saw this too, I bet, because you saw in early April or May, people tried to create these sort of virtual activities to join together in, right? Everything from like, let's all take a group cooking class to let's just have a cocktails hour on Zoom. And like, I'll be honest, nothing is more depressing than drinking alone by yourself with a screen full, like a Brady Bunch square of people that you can't be in person, right? So we all got a little too hungover from Zoom happy hours and it wasn't because, right? It wasn't a sort of a real um, activity, right? And so when you're looking to use a tool like Zoom to connect and deepen that relationship, um, it takes a lot more structure. It takes a lot more intentionality than just, we're gonna plan this activity and it's all gonna work out. It takes a level of conversation that people who are skilled at having a deeper conversation have. So that means show up with specific questions that you can ask 
to deepen the relationship. There's a couple different ways you can do this. All of them work really, really well. Uh, on internal teams, we run things like uh, what we call fika, which is the Swedish word for to have coffee. It's just it's just getting together to have a, a coffee time with somebody. But the whole point of it is to get to know your coworker in a non-work environment. So the whole point of the conversation is not work related. It's not not you know it, it's it's much more broad than that. We're looking to build those bonds. There's also the idea of work sprints, which is time where you pair together with people and do work, you just do it alone together, right? So I actually couldn't have written my book without this. Every day, every weekday at 11 a.m., I had a work sprint appointment set with two other writer friends of mine who were working on books, and we would exchange a few pleasantries, and then we'd focus in on the writing. And then when we got a little tired, 25, 30 minutes in, we'd put our head up, we'd talk for a little while, et cetera, right? It was, it was sort of our structured way of trying to do it. The, the interesting thing about virtual work is it doesn't make relationships unimportant. It makes them more important, but it takes much more deliberateness to structure those things. And I've talked about activities here, but there's other stuff too. Like what are the little rituals that you are, are going to develop on your team, right? We all have those little rituals. Could be like a Monday's high five thing. It could be an inside joke. Um, I've seen other deeper rituals uh, on teams and the ones that uh, are sort of most meaningful in a, in a Zoom environment are the ones that that can obviously translate into that. So I've seen rituals. My favorite one, actually, I'll just tell you, I'll just jump right to it. My favorite ritual for a team of people is that instead of using the uh, the applause or emojis or stuff that's built into web conferencing, they decided whenever somebody has a good point, they're going to use silent clapping, right, from sign language, from American sign language or British sign language as their sort of tool, which is funny because then they're working with clients and they're in this meeting and there's three or four people from the client side, four, three or four people from the Zoom. Somebody makes a good point and the whole screen's filled with this. And the client's like, what, what's, what's that all about? Then you explain it to them. Now they're in on the ritual. So they're part of the in-group, right? Um, we used to, when we, were, when we were in person, we used to develop these rituals just sort of organically. They just kind of happened. Well, now we've just got to be a little bit more deliberate about it, but it doesn't mean it can't happen. Right. So between structured conversations that actually explore non-work topics and build and deepen that relationship and physical things like rituals, we can go pretty far in building and deepening relationships in a virtual environment. What we can't do is just rely on being in the same space together to build it for us, like all of the people on the activity based network side were doing forever and then found themselves out of practice. It takes structure. It takes deliberation. It takes a plan. But you know, now at least I hope this interview has provided a little bit of that plan that you can go as a jumping off point to figure out how can I have more of these conversations? What are our team rituals or even our client side rituals, right? What are the things we're going to build that are meaningful and let people feel like they're in this in-group with us that create that? <laughs> I was giving you a high five for people that... So I love it. Listening, obviously, there's some people, some people watch and some people listen. So if you're listening, you couldn't see me waving my hands with the silent high five, but I was or the applause, but I was doing it. David, I really like that. We had a we had a client that um, for their standing ovation, they all go like this and put a big O over their head oh, with their yeah. arms. So for folks I like who can't it. see, I'm just creating a big O with my arms, and but you could really visibly see it on the big, even on the big Zoom board because you know you're doing your whole body like that. Um, in college, that was a our, our fraternity called that a black hole, and that beat either anything of rock, scissors, or paper. But you only got one huh. black hole for your lifetime, so nobody ever did it. <laughs> so, qu follow up question back. Um, I'm really keen on these questions. You know, in one of the past episodes, everybody go back and watch them. Uh, David gave us a really great question to start to foster relationships and and transition for the sort of the open ended get to know you to a little bit more of a sharing struggles and and starting to think about commercial things. So David, on these on these structured calls, intentionality. I love the word you use there around really thinking about how we can bond a little bit more in a virtual environment. What are some of those questions that you'd recommend people ask each other and answer? Yeah, so I, I think uh, candidly, the question itself doesn't matter as much as having a plan, right? Um, because if you're just getting in there and you're relying on we're going to feel each other out, et cetera, you're not going to ask those deeper questions. The point of the questions, though, is to ask questions that can be answered in a work or a non-work context. So instead of saying stuff like, what do you do or, or you know, what's your job function? I'll say things like, you know, what are you looking forward to? Or um, what are you most excited about right now? What are you most uh, thankful for right now? I can answer that about work or I can answer that about uh, anything. I can say, yeah, Tom Brady just won his seventh Super Bowl. That's pretty cool. And now you know that I follow football. You know, some I self-disclosed some other personal piece. 
Truthfully, my favorite question, because I'm a bit of a nerd, is when I feel that I'm in a place in the conversation where I can safely ask this, I will ask people, who's your favorite superhero? And here's why. It has nothing to do with the superhero. Everyone has one or they hate superheroes, but that unless it's a cool story too. Um, and everyone has a reason why. So, you know, my favorite superhero, for example, is Batman. Um, what I like about Batman is that he's not super, right? He's someone with uh, immense wealth and a sense of responsibility. I think those two things should almost always go together. Um, he's someone who's focused on making the world a better place. So he's developed himself personally through martial arts and the discipline of it, right? Um, but I like that idea that he's, he's relatable because he's not super, but he is someone who feels driven by a cause, et cetera, right? And now anybody else who is Batman can bond. And I guess technically anybody who has Iron Man can bond too, because really they're the same character. They're just in two different franchises, right? Um, but everybody has that story, whether it's Wonder Woman, if it's Green Lantern, or, or again, they have, um, they, they say no one, I never really got into superheroes and I can go, great. Well, well you know, what, what was your thing when you were a kid, right? And we can still ask that question and find out a bit about that history. Now, that's not one I'll throw out right off the bat. I'll usually start with a question like, what are you looking forward to? Or what are you really grateful for right now? Because again, that can be answered work-related should they choose. But as we get further, I'll bust out some of those questions that encourage people to dive into their childhood or at least something uh, older than a decade about their history. And it creates this beautiful jumping off point and learning more about them. And the more I know about them, the more I have reasons to follow up with them, the more things I have to discuss with them, the more likely I'm, I am to find something we have in common. Um, but even if it's just little stuff, right? Like, Mo, now you know that I like Batman. So when the new Batman movie finally comes out at the end of this year, you know, you can send me an email and go, hey, did you see this new trailer? Even if that's just a reason to ping a prospective client you haven't talked to in six months, it still goes way further than just, hey, I wanted to check in on you, see if you had any, you know, whatever, right? Those little personal details go so much further. Oh, yeah. Well, and back to our mutual friend, Adam Grant's uncommon commonality. I mean, you can't see it up in the corner, I don't think, but all the graphic novels that are up there. And I was thinking, like, I think I would choose somebody on the Justice League or, or on the uh, uh, Legion of Superheroes, almost because I like eclectic things. But like Cosmic Boy or um, Element Lad, I don't know if you know the Legion of Superheroes, but a little more obscure DC comic that I always liked when I was a kid. And uh, anyway, we would if if we weren't doing a podcast, I would ask you more about Batman, and I would tell you about Element Lad. <laughs> <laughs> so it totally works. I could just actually oh, I love feel it. myself in it. So yeah, love that. Right? Question. No, and right, at the David, and at the. I was just going to say, and at the very least, we bonded over being in the DC franchise, which despite the fact that their movies recently have been terrible, is still the better comic book franchise. I've flipped, man. I was DC up until like five or six years ago, and I just finally made the switch. I couldn't. I held on for a long time, David. I'm 53. I held on to my mid 40s, and I finally flipped to Marvel. <laughs> am, I, am I an okay person? Am I all right? <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll forget. I'll give you a little absolution, Mo. But there's more than just the movies, right? So, yeah, I love it. Well, hey, David, this has been so fun. People are going to want to. You've dropped so much knowledge here. People are going to want to get more of that from you. Should I'm guessing they might want to go to davidberkus.com. Can you? Can you validate that? Is that the right place to go? That, that's that's the right place to go. It's an easy place to go. There are no there are no bat. Actually, there is a Batman reference on the website. So there you go. Um, and and again, it's it's uh, it's relatively. If you if you're listening, and you're like I don't even know how to spell Burgess. Doesn't matter. Google does. So if you type it in, you'll either find me or you'll find the interior designer Nate Burkus, and you'll know you're in the wrong place. All right, I know we've closed out the show, but I got to ask you one more: Is Batman Unwrapped your favorite graphic novel, or is it a different? Is there a different one? <sighs> so my favorite graphic novel is, I mean, isn't has nothing to do with DC or Marvel. Um, it's actually the the original graphic novel of Three Hundred because I also loved Gates of Fire, which is the Stephen Pressfield novel about the Battle of Thermopylae. So that would actually be my favorite graphic novel, right? Of the Batman, yeah, I like Batman Unwrapped uh, a lot, but um, I gotta go with I gotta go with that as a favorite graphic novel. I love it. Well, three hundred's up there. It's really big. It's like a big bound thing, and I have it up there. So it's up on that. It the is. It's cool. David, this has been awesome. 
It's so cool. And the, and the art, art is so good. All right. Well, we bonded on that, everybody. That's David Burkus. He's the bomb. Yeah, I know you love him because you had an uncommon commonality with something around superheroes there. Go to davidburkus.com. Check out his stuff. He has a ton of resources. Really good stuff. Now, if you haven't listened to the prior episodes I taped with David, you got to do that because he added even more value back there. And we got one last question we're going to ask in our next episode. I'm going to ask David, how do you keep focused on the long-term stuff in a virtual environment that's going to pay dividends for you for years instead of worrying about all the day-to-day things? How do we build our platform so it's really going to pay off for us? Hey, everybody. It's Mo Bunnell, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. And this is my fourth episode that I've been taping. And I got to tell you, having a blast with David Burkus. We've covered everything from how to get our Zoom set up right to the best questions to ask early and later stage in relationships to even our favorite graphic novels. I mean, this is really, really great content. And my last question for David is, it's so easy for us as busy professionals to just keep focusing on the day-to-day, to keep focus on the emails that come in. His book, Leading for Everywhere, has a really top-down approach when it comes to leading big teams, both internally and externally, in a virtual world. So David, my question is, how can we keep focused on the long game? How can we keep focused on doing the right things to build our platform, to build our relationships when we're being distracted all the time in this virtual world? All right, I can't wait to see what you answer, go for it. (laughs) Yeah, so my answer is a little counterintuitive and it's don't, right? The The short term matters, but here's why, right? There's actually a ton of research about human motivation and how it relates to timelines. And when a timeline, when a deadline or when a long game type thing is too far out there, we have a tendency to think it's more difficult than it really is and a tendency to procrastinate because of it. I mean, to be honest with you, this is everything from health to retirement accounts to all of that stuff we know. The long game is too far out there, and so we're not necessarily motivated. It seems too difficult, right? So we're not necessarily motivated to do the short stuff. So you make the long game into your short stuff. What is your six-month goal? What is that project that has a timeline of four months from now? Okay, what are the milestones leading up to that? Right. And that way you can focus in on them, because what happens, you will always, always and at remote or a work from home environment where there's no one to like look over your shoulder. At least I hope they're not digitally looking over your shoulder in some creepy spy software fashion in a remote environment. It's more important to, to know this about your own psychology. You will always default to the short term. You will always prefer to empty out your email inbox, even though that doesn't actually create any value. You're, you're always going to prefer that. So take that long term stuff, cut it up. And that way you can focus on it for the short term. I love it. David, have you ever been doing a podcast interview and the leaf blower guy comes right out your window? Because that's what just happened. Where are you? (laughs) Yeah, oh, I can totally hear. Where where are you? I'm behind. I'm behind a jet engine. No, hey, we're we're taping a, a podcast about we're in a work, virtual environment and a leaf blower person just went outside my door. This is great. Hey, David, I got another question. How do you handle when leaf blowers come out your door? <laughs> I think you make a joke out of it, right? <laughs> what else can you do? I mean, I'm a... I'm a big fan of the rule that if there's an elephant in the room, you should just introduce him, uh, right? Because there's nothing you can do to get him out of there until everybody acknowledges he's in there, right? So, so the sleep blower is our is our elephant in the room, but it's our reality, right? We're we're in this great work from home experiment. We are all BBC dad right now, right? So it's okay. We'll we'll go with it. The only reason I was confused about the leaf blower is that as we're recording this, I, I, I thought the entire United States and Canada was under ice. So I don't know where you are that has leaves, but I am jealous. <laughs> I'm taping this from Atlanta. So uh, yeah, it was. it's like 65 today. <laughs> All right, David. So back to our real show. Everybody hopefully will have a laugh about that. But this is real life, right? We're taping a, we're taping a podcast about life in a virtual environment, how to lead and the leaf blower people come up in the middle of it. This is great. Okay, so back to you. I really liked your idea of the long game and cutting it down into short pieces. Do you have any tips about working with teams? So let's say um, let's say we're, we're consultants and we work with one of the big three management consulting firms in the world. We do a lot of work with, with folks from one of those firms. 
And they have to stand up projects that sometime will be five years long. Same, give, same with high-end litigators that are defending against uh, patent protection or things like that, or a class action. I think about our accounting firms that, are sta- that win a three or five-year deal for audit process. They're standing up these big projects. So while we can think in terms of long-term about our own personal goals, a lot of times the professionals that are listening to us on this podcast are really focused on really long-term projects. So when it comes to a virtual world, your expertise, what do people do to make sure that they're doing the right things in those short-term sprints to set them up for success over a big engagement? Yeah, so so we start doing the same thing, right? We look at the long-term and we break it up into those milestones. We obviously have to co-create those, right? It has to be us and the client talking together about if this is where we want to be in five years, these are, are the milestones that we have to come on. And then, and I'm a big fan of this for any team, whether it's a fully internal team, a project team that's a mix of client and, and internal people, or like a, a fully mixed team that's like client company, freelancers, et, et cetera. Um, and that is having a regular check-in process. I steal the questions from uh, from the world of agile, actually, that whatever our period is, whether it's a month, a week, right, every three months, et cetera, I think I want to leave a check-in process with everybody having space to answer these three questions. What did I just do, right? What, what did I just complete? What am I working on now? And what's blocking my progress, right? The first two are just status updates. What did I complete? We, we mapped out five years and the milestone by we want to have these things done every quarter, right? So what did I just complete? Is it in line with what I'm supposed to have completed by Q2 of year two, right? What am I working on now? That's just a reassurance that, that A, that I'm actually focused on what I need to be focused on, that no one on the team is dropping the ball by ignoring a big objective, and also that nobody's duplicating effort by both working on that. And then the third one, and this is perhaps the most important one, what's blocking my progress is the invitation to ask for help. The real problem servicing clients in that long-term engagement is that nobody wants to admit when they need help or when the project needs to pivot or when we've hit a roadblock and we let it sort of fester until it's too late to correct it. And now it is five years later and the client's disappointed and we're angry at the client because they didn't blah, blah, blah. But if we had taken the time every quarter to check in and go, what have we completed? What are we focused on now? And what's blocking our progress? We can make the appropriate pivots in the project to make sure we get at exactly where we wanted to be five years from now anyway, even if we had to take a different path. I love it. And that simple construct makes so much sense. And you're right. A lot of times, maybe, maybe our clients do that internally. I think probably not as much as they should, but they rarely do it externally. They rarely, our clients rarely do it with their clients. And having that regular check-in would help you celebrate success, uh, realize all that you accomplished together, like you said, sort of uncover things that people might be worried about. If it, if keeps they could keep sort of the small things small, But um, I think you're exactly right. Without that constant and regular cadence of communication, you could end up with a client that's really angry at you and you didn't even know it was happening because you didn't have those kind of things. Um, David, I love it. So where where should people go to learn more about you and leading from anywhere and also your, your other books too? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, the single best place for all things Burke, I don't know why you would want to go there, but it exists. It's davidburkus.com. Um, so that's B-U-R-K-U-S if you're like, how do this is such a weird last name. But honestly, if you get that wrong, don't worry about it. Google and DuckDuckGo both know how to spell my name right. So it's, it's fine. Um, but there's a ton there about the different books. There's a lot of different resources and then ways to connect on social and keep these conversations going. And, and truthfully, I hope you do that. If you're listening to this, if you listen to all four episodes, right, and you want to keep the conversation going, reach out to me on one of those platforms because it, we're not all going back to the office, at least not all of us and not all of the time. So how do we exist in this remote work, this work from anywhere world? That's a conversation that's going to be going on for a long time. So let's let's keep engaging on it. Oh, I love it. Well, I was so happy that you could join us on the show. I've absolutely had a blast. Not only just technically learning from you, but just having a good time. You've got such a great personality and we laughed about several different things. So folks, if you want to hear some laughter and learn something, make sure you listen to the prior episodes that we taped. And the next one, what I'm going to do is synthesize all that I learned from David on these on these very poorly written notes, <laughs> but I'm going to synthesize it because I wrote down two pages of stuff and I'm going to pick the top three things that I learned from David that I think you ought to pay attention to too. That's coming up next. David, thank you so much from all of our audience for being on the show. Real Relationships, Real Revenue. I think people are going to take a lot away from this. Oh, thank you so much for having me. 
Hi, this is Mo Bunnell, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. I'm uh, author of the award-winning book, The Snowball System, and I and my teams have trained over 15,000 people all over the world, high-end experts, professionals on sound, effective, efficient, and authentic business development techniques. I absolutely love teaching business development techniques because I know it's about crafting a vision for somebody's future that may, they might not even know you yet, but crafting a vision and moving people to an experience where they're going to be better off because they've met you before. That's what business development is. So in the last four episodes, I talked with another expert, David Burke, he's an organizational psychologist, some of probably my favorite discipline when it comes to PhDs. He's an organizational psychologist. He's gone off on his own, start his own organization. He's got several best-selling and award-winning books. And his latest book is so timely, I had to find him and have him on the show. The book's called Leading From Anywhere, and it's all about how do we establish relationships more strongly in a virtual world, and how do we foster them, and how do we take them to new heights using all the different technology that we've got to do so. And that skill, which is it's complex skills, and it can be learned, any complex skill can be learned, that skill is not just important now, the, the day this is released, but it's going to be more and more important going forward because this virtual world and the way that we work together all over the world in new ways digitally is going to be more important going forward than it even is at any given day. So to tap into David's big brain and learn what we can from him and his content and leading from anywhere, really important and really applicable to business development. Now, before we get into this episode where I share the top three things that I enjoyed learning from David, I want to let you know about the Grow Big Playbook. The Grow Big Playbook is a place you can go. You go to growbigplaybook.com and you can download an instant download. You can read it in about eight minutes and it's got the eight beliefs you need to have in your head to become great at growth. So head over to Grow Big Playbook for that, and then you'll be signed up for our weekly newsletter. That's where we share our complimentary courses, our best of the best podcast episodes, our learning library, and links to it, where all of this stuff is no charge. We give it away, but you gotta go over to the Grow Big Playbook and sign up there at growbigplaybook.com to get it. So go to growbigplaybook.com. All right, I hit you over the head pretty hard with that, so we won't mention that again. All right, here's what I learned from, from David. Boy, I, the, the most poignant thing, I learned three big things, but the most poignant thing is we've got to have sort of an agreement with our internal teams and our clients, sort of our, I think he called it a, a internal team working agreement, like how, how we're going to work together in the world that we're in. That might be all digital or part digital and in person or all in person, whatever our world is, to have an agreement on which methods, which communication platforms do we use at different times and for what, and really know what each thing is for and agree to that. And he walked us through in a prior episode exactly how to do it. So go back and listen to his color, but the super quick answer is, you set out with questions, what do we do when this happens? What do you do when that happens? And then you turn that into agreements. I agree that we will do this. I agree with we will do that. The, the I agrees end up talking about how, how often you check in, what platform do you use? Is it email, phone call, Zoom, Slack, Microsoft Teams? You know, we've all got so many, text message. We've all got so many things. And, and how we do that all efficiently and how long you wait for a response on different platforms. Basically, you're getting into agreement with your team about how you communicate where so there's no confusion. It's brilliant. And then the, the next level he took it, which of course applies to all of our stuff, is having an agreement like that that you work with as a team. His idea, I'll finish with this, his idea of working out internally first and then sharing it with your client team and say, hey, here's how we work together internally. What do you think? Well, his advice is good. Your client's probably going to go, we need that. So now they're getting extra value. And it prompts the question, how do we work together collectively and and more efficiently? So you'll develop your own with the client or just tweak what you've already got for your internal team. So I thought that was really cool. I've never thought about that. We've, at our organization, at Big Bundle Idea Group, 
We've had general conversations about, we'll use Voxer for this and Slack for that, and but we haven't really built that across the entire team, and I can definitely see the value in doing that. And then the part with your clients makes total, total, total sense. So that was the first thing. The second thing, I thought this was really good, the creation of white space, the creation of the ability to informally chat with people and just sort of check in. The, the, he called it the meeting before the meeting, right? It's when you're huddled around the room and you're waiting for the conference room to well, open up or you're waiting for the last person to get there or whatever and you're chit-chatting about this or that. Those were times of bonding. Those were times when we were catching up on people's weekends. We were hearing about what was going on in the personal life, that, that we're hearing about what's going on in the organization and what we need to focus on next, what happened, you know, things like that. And that doesn't exist as much anymore. So I love this just simple, practical idea of, you know, if you've got a team meeting that starts, you know, on the hour, maybe as the leader, you say, hey, I'm going to go ahead and join 15 minutes early. You don't have to, but if you want to pop in, go ahead. What a brilliant idea, creating that white space, creating the meeting before the meeting. And you could plan these out ahead if you're a leader, where you have spots in your day that you just know you're going to be on a call and or on a, on a Zoom or WebEx or whatever, and if people want to drop in, they can, but they don't have to. But that kind of informal chat would be really valuable, super cool. So I thought that was a really neat idea and, and easily, um, easily implementable. The third thing that I really liked from David was just being really intentional about our questions. That you could sort of, um, the idea is the old days when you're in person, you could sort of fumble around with okay questions. But the fact that you're sitting together for a couple hours at dinner, you're eventually going to stumble into something important. You didn't have to prep as much. Now, we've got half a chapter on how to ask great questions in the Snowball system. Our model is called the Gravitas model. So we've always been really really focused on asking intentional and thought-provoking questions. And we actually use the same words David did, being intentional about it. But the thing that I thought was interesting about David's take was that in our virtual world, we've got to dial that up even more. We've got to be even more intentional. And I liked how he talked about the sequence of questions that are a little more general up front and that little more that could lead to more commercial or business development kind of things later. Uh, the in general up front, trying to ask questions, I love this nuance he added, of asking a question that could be answered personally or professionally. Hey, what are you really excited about? Hey, what are you looking forward to? Those kind of simple questions could let somebody go personal if they want to go personal, go professional if they want to go professional, and it just starts things on a positive. I really like that. Um, really good kind of warm-up kind of question. And then as he moved forward, hey, if we were working together, this isn't exactly the way he asked it, but, but it's close. If we would work together and we were, we were here a year from the day and we were going to pop champagne because we were toasting to success, what would that success be? Well, that really gets the mind thinking about what we can do together and uh, what would be successful, what does success look like, really getting the mind to, to wrap around um, what could be vision. You know, at its core, I, I feel like business development is helping see a future for others they don't see yet, doing things that very positively and authentically and helpfully moves them to see that vision and just takes little steps all the time to get there. If, if anything, business development is the idea of crafting a future that's better for people than they realize and bringing them towards it. It's about abundance. It's about opportunity. It's about helpfulness. It's about experts helping experts get even better. And that question, you know, what would we be toasting a year from now if, if we were toasting and working together, that sort of helps crystallize or start to form what that future can look like. And, and I could imagine somebody answering that question and starting to think about then what's the how. Like once you once you craft where we're headed, you know, it's natural to start thinking about what's the next step. That's really positive. And I think I think people, as we publish this uh, as we publish this podcast episode, 
I think people need some positivity right now. They need some optimism. They need something to look forward to. So by asking great questions like David taught us, we, we, could, we could start to help somebody see a positive future and then, of course, start moving towards it incrementally and in a way that was really, really fun and enjoyable as we made each step along the journey. So those are the big things I learned from David. I, I just really enjoyed him. I enjoyed his uh I enjoyed his banter. I enjoyed his wit. I enjoyed his humor. Uh, we talked about graphic novels. I mean, what's not to like? So if you like this recap episode, if you haven't listened to the prior four, where David asked just some really, really great questions, then do it. But, but, but I really like those big three, you know, that team working agreement, getting the white space and, and figuring out, pre-planning that, finding time to make those informal connections, those water cooler connections, if you will. And then, then that last one, being super intentional about our, our questions that we're going to ask. And by the way, if you want more on that, you know, I think it's in chapter seven of the snowball system that has a whole half chapter on how to ask great questions. But I like David's specifics. He had a couple, couple that I hadn't heard quite in that way. That was pretty neat. All right, folks, that's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. This has been a blast. This season is so fun, taping all these episodes with all these amazing people, and David was definitely one of those. So if you haven't yet, go over to davidberkus.com. Check out those free resources he told us about, because I was just poking around on the website a second ago, and they're really good. There's like over a dozen really great, no-charge resources that you can download right away, and I know they're going to help a lot of people that uh, that grab onto that. That's at davidberkus.com. All right, everybody. Keep doing great work. Keep striving to grow that book of business, grow that relate, grow those relationships. Because if you do, you're going to grow your career.